All right, welcome back, everybody. How was the break? Did you get enough coffee for you? Do we, uh, I don't see that. enough coffee in the room. I can't hear you. Yeah. All right, okay, okay, now we're talking. Hey, welcome to the second uh, part of our, uh, let's say, first portion of the day. Uh, very great start, great uh, uh, speeches in the morning. Um, now, uh, you know, we, we all live in this uh, era of digital Darwinism, as they say, right? So, uh, many, many big established uh, company fabrics, uh, they're b getting disrupted, sometimes even threatened by some of the tech startups. We've seen a lot of examples earlier. Uh, we always talk about this Ubers, Airbnb, and so on. Now, most of these Fortune 500 companies, um, if you look at it from, uh, let's say, the year 2000, uh, many of them do not exist anymore. That's due to this disruption that has been happening, or either they have been acquired, gone bankrupt, or merged. Now, given this trend, it, it sort of encouraged many of the big companies to look at other avenues, look at new avenues on how to tackle this digital disruption or how to come with counter-disruptive measures in order to stay ahead uh, with the curve. And uh, yeah, at the moment, as the study says, it's about 38% of the leading 200 uh, companies in the world have set up something called innovation centers or uh, innovation hubs, different names about similar purpose, stay ahead on the curve, have counter-disruptive measures. But the question really is, how to run such an innovation center successfully? What are the expectations? What are the challenges? And in order to discuss that, I have a very uh, interesting panel today. So I'm going to invite one by one. And uh, first, please welcome Thomas Eisenbart from uh, business, uh, Daimler AG, and he's the head of business innovation. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for joining us. I'm sure he's going to tell us on uh, how to uh, basically change one of the uh, best brands in the world. <laughs> All right. um, next, I would like to call uh, up on the stage uh, Sebastian. Sebastian Fitko, he's uh, from the Berlin Outpost, uh, heading the Berlin Outpost for RWE. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. So Sebastian, for the last 15 years, has been working on the uh, periphery of the corporates and the startups, and happy to have you here to share your experiences. Uh, next up, uh, <laughs> we call him Mr. Innovation Center in a way, uh, Olivier, Olivier Harvey. He's the principal for strategy and transformation at Capgemini. Please welcome. Well, I think uh, Olivier and his colleagues, they're, they're sort of the closest observers of this uh, overall trend and the innovation centers and uh, look forward to having your views on this fantastic topic. Uh, next up. Head of Innovation Center Network uh, for SAP, Jürgen Müller. You've met him earlier. <laughs> his, job, his job is to find the uh, next big business for SAP, uh, next big billion worth business for SAP, um, and he's my boss. So, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so welcome. And uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit free, so if you uh, have any questions, just raise your hand. Uh, the lights are not that powerful. I'm sure I'll spot you. So, uh, first one, Thomas, from car sharing to self-driving cars, batteries for homes, how does Daimler tackle all these challenges? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's not a crucial thing or it's not a magic thing. I think uh, we started in 2007 uh, with a group of people and basically this is... Uh, uh, the size of the group didn't, didn't change a lot during that time and um, we had a direct link to the board and we had the great freedom and the budget which we never spent uh, during the years. So, um, and the and, uh, big freedom. And then I would say that's the, how we started and we are questioning ourselves every day um, uh, if we are doing the right thing, if we are going the right direction, um, if we're having the right people. Uh, if we should uh, uh, give up the whole thing, because at the moment all the business units starting their own activities after 10 years, which is super. And we thought about, okay, having a big party and uh, 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 finalizing business innovation at Daimler, because the job is done. done so yeah. that's the kind of, uh, let's say, atmosphere we're working in every day, uh, question ourselves and looking forward and uh, being interested in new things like SAP doing here in uh, Berlin. So, so what's the role of your innovation center in particular? 
At the beginning, it was we were, were named as a think tank. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and uh, the aim was to work new business models out until the proof of concept is done. So we did in, in we had a stage gate process. We developed all the tools you know, mm -hmm. um, for ourselves. And then we did basically two things. We did an internal pilot and then an external pilot. And so we did it also with Car2Go. And also when we do pilots, sometimes because we have a, a big brand, we do it not in a big city or in a, in a very spotlight city. We used for Car2Go, some of you might know it, Ulm. Mm -hmm. So if that wouldn't work out in Ulm, nothing would happen on the world too. And were no damage at all at Mercedes, <laughs> despite the fact that maybe the Swabian Zeitung or the Ulmer Zeitung was reporting on it. But doing that in Hamburg or in New York, that would be a totally different story. And that's how we work. So we work with the first pilot internally, do a second pilot with a active customers, and then looking how the things are driving us. OK, that's good. So Sebastian, how, how does your setup differ from uh, what we heard from Thomas? Yeah, so maybe it differs in that way that uh, when you look at the situation of RWE as a large utility, um, they are really confronted with a big change uh, due to the energy transition. And so there will be no stone on the other, let's say, in five to ten years, and uh, the business model definitely will vanish. And so I think this is uh, different uh, to, to have a totally different uh, start uh, when you're building up a new innovation hub. And so the innovation hub of uh, RWE really focusing on, on let's say, uh, leap forward innovations and not the incremental stuff that is uh, done in the, in the um, existing corporation. And then we also, and I think this is also similar, to say, okay, we have a setup where we built a hub and that is, the, 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 that is still close to Essen. Yeah, where the headquarters of, of RWE is, and we have different outposts. And the outposts are in Tel Aviv and uh, Silicon Valley and then Berlin. And so we're working here very collaboratively, but we really reach out to the ecosystem. So we want to work with the best talents from those ecosystems, get the startups on board, and really creating viable interfaces uh, between the innovation and the, ex and the operational business uh, to bring both parts together. So this is one part, and the other part is definitely also like you did uh, to develop own ventures uh, that we test in, in a secure environment and then go out step by step. And so there are some similarities, but a little bit a different uh, environment to start. All right. uh, so actually, why did your company choose to have such an outpost kind of setup? Or why did RWE in the end? So I think they, they started uh, to, to think about, okay, we have to start a little bit close to the existing business because otherwise we would create a totally independent satellite, mm -hmm. right? And the satellite is also kind of a silo. So we have silos in the existing business and we don't want to create another yep. silo. And so therefore there needs to be a closeness to the, to the existing business and then we can start growing out of that because then we have an existing and a work uh, and, and, and viable link uh, to the existing business. And then to say, okay, we need to go out because Essen is not the place uh, where you get the best talent on board. You have some talent, right? But it's totally different when you go uh, to Tel Aviv when it's mm -hmm. come to uh, technology, entrepreneurship, or to, to Silicon Valley and even to Berlin. And so I think uh, it's really it's smart to do it that way because we were able to start last year uh, very small and we were able to do our things by ourselves and uh, not looking all the time what Essen is doing. And that helped us to a lot to do the right things first and then grow. And now we're having a good established link not only to the, to the uh, innovation hub as itself but also to the business. And so that worked quite out. Oh, that's great. No, thank you. So you can uh, turning to you. Could, could you please explain us a little bit on what's what's the focus um, and uh, you know and and the sort of a setup of the SAP's innovation center network? You mentioned earlier it's a network and this was the nucleus. Um, how do you how do you keep the focus? Yeah, sure. Um, within SAP, so also as Stefan Ries mentioned, we are almost eighty thousand employees. Then we have different divisions. One division is products and innovation. Um, Bernd Leukert is the board member for that, so I'm reporting to him. So you need board backing in order to do something like this. And then, of course, so SAP serves uh, 25 industries, like automotive, like utilities, and we serve 12, we call it lines of businesses, like HR and procurement, supply chain management, all these things. 
And this is where we spend most of our energy, most of our money is coming from. We, and each and every of those segments have the task to being market leader um, or becoming market leader. So these are the goals. And then um, you focus on that, which means you need to be super innovative in that space. Mm -hmm. But it also, we did an analysis of why do large companies fail. And uh, you see um, at least three things. You miss out opportunities beyond this focus. Um, you miss business model innovations, and you miss potentially disruptive technologies. So that's why and how we founded the Innovation Center, which is like around these this 25 by 12 metrics. So we really look at um, what is beyond that, and that's it's not more innovative, it's not the smartest people are working there, it's just a different role that you need in order to keep a company healthy and successful also mid and long term. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jürgen. Olivier, typical setups? Anything do we miss uh, from, from your study standpoint? You've been very closely observing them. <laughs> yes, well, it was quite interesting because when we started these uh, studies a few years ago with uh, about a corporate innovation center, we found out, well, I mean, there's no such corporate innovation center, only one type of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it starts with the names, right? You have the labs, incubators, accelerators, hubs, etc. So, and everybody's asking itself when setting up an innovation center, how should I name it? Or should <laughs> it be the next incubator, the next uh, accelerator? Um, so it was very interesting and quite challenging also to find the differences uh, between all these uh, centers. And I mean, we have quite a mix already here. Mm -hmm. Um, the mix you have at uh, AWE is also, it's not one corporate innovation center, it's a mix of several ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to structure them as saying there are these innovation labs, including incubators, but also the accelerators, mm -hmm. which have these batches of startups going through several times a year uh, through an innovation center. Uh, but you also have these university anchors. Uh, you have this mix also with uh, GTech at ESMT with uh, RVE. Um, which is another model. Uh, you have the community anchor also. Uh, actually, you start starting this here, as Eric Ries said, it's from business to business, but also to the customers. Mm -hmm. So getting the customers in here to test the products. Um, so have this customer centricity. So we have these four groups of corporate innovation centers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So we, we do realize that at least one common thing in the pattern that they are necessarily different from the headquarters. What would you name as... Anybody, one or two key main differences from the headquarters? So I would say we are absolutely in exploration mode, and so the corporate headquarters is more on exploitation and a strategy uh, for the whole group, and so we have much more freedom. And we need this freedom because we are moving in an area of uncertainty, and we have to deal with that. So strategy is a constant flux and development for us, mm -hmm. and so we have to move differently, and we have to be much, much more open uh, to the external world because we have to create a kind of a network organization that we already here before mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise uh, we are not uh, identifying uh, those opportunities that are, that are really uh, could change the game. And so therefore we are in constant uh, evolution and sometimes revolution and change ourselves. And that's also, I think, something uh, that, that this is the reason why there is no best practice because best mm -hmm. practice means also mediocrity. Yeah. yeah, because you have a lot of things and we have now best practice, but every uh, corporate organization has to find its own special fit uh, on, his ta on, on the innovation. Yeah, and therefore we have to aim for excellence, and excellence means we are uh, on top of uh, not uh, uh, mediocrity. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that's really important. Yeah, I think two remarks from my side. Uh, I still, I think, still today we are the real cross-divisional and cross-functional team, mm -hmm. and not a team of youngsters, mm -hmm. guys, old guys like me, basically are surrounded by a lot of young people, but they have. 15 to 20 years experience in their field as designer, as production guy, as engineer, as sales guy like me. And, and so this is a totally different atmosphere and we built up the company in a very small group, the whole world and the whole experience in it. And the second is that we do not a lot of PowerPoints, we try to build something very fast mm -hmm. and spend money for that. And usually before you can spend money in the, in the headquarter, in the yeah. company, you need uh, 10 signatures, you need uh, the budget built before, one year before, and if it's not in the budget, then uh, sorry, uh, we didn't plan it, yeah. so we can't do it. So that's 
different. And even we're not using our purchase department. If we need something, we go there and buy something, and that's it. Mm. Uh, but that's an amazing point you, mm. point you brought out. But, but that freedom comes with certain challenges as well, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, what, what are the key challenges uh, from your side at Daimler that you face, uh, let's say, just one or two comes to your mind? I mean, the, I, I would say the biggest uh, issue is uh, to let the surrounding understand that 90% of what you are doing is failure. And that's, <laughs> that's incredible if you say you have 10 millions and you just lock them into the basket by t 9 million. Yeah. I mean, this is, and then th you have a totally disconnect and misunderstanding, and these are what the stupid guys are doing, we need the money on much better. So to manage this um, relationship between your old buddies and <laughs> the new buddies, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging uh, for, for, for you personally. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, speaking of some of the best practices, Jürgen, um, any best practices you want to highlight? I mean, like I said, freedom, challenges, but at the same time, few things that have worked. Uh, yeah, so what, what really made a difference for us is, um, in the beginning I shared that in the we have only have been engineers, we started adding designers, we started adding business developers, also to having the desirability angle and viability angle. And then that we are allowed to running like a startup, we have full end-to-end -end responsibility. Um, so in the, in the big organization, in the uh, mothership, you want to leverage um, the size that you have, you want to use shared services, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, we, we don't do that. So we have dedicate, uh, dedicated teams for our projects, and they are end-to-end -end responsible. And then what also helped a lot, that was quite an effort um, to, to doing that internally, is our handover process. Mm -hmm because POCs are nice. In the beginning, we also thought it would be sufficient to showing that something will work. Um, but then if I now write everything up and give it to you, um, <laughs> likelihood is high that you say, hey, cool, get in line. I have my backlog is full for the next two years. Uh, maybe we look at that afterwards. Um, and what we have now is that once um, projects are mature enough, meaning really revenue, so we have product responsibility, initial su market success, revenue, um, I cannot share numbers, but it's a low, low double-digit million revenue numbers. Then it becomes really interesting. I thought talked about this 25 by 12 metrics, so if you look at that over time, it evolves. So, so when things now then get in focus, like personalized medicine, for example, at SAP, we say that now a dedicated board member, Steve Singh, is taking care of that. And that for us means that the team actually moves with that. So out of those, in the beginning, it were four people with 40% of their time in 2013. We built that up to over 50 people working on the topic. And those 50 also moved out of the innovation center to the normal larger organization, and we got refunded. That also was quite tough to negotiate. <laughs> we are refunded in order to do new stuff. Did you manage one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> no. <laughs> Which is okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's you great. You have to prove yourself again and again, so also for new topics. It doesn't, as you also said, um, start small. So it doesn't make sense to then put 50 people on a topic that you still need to explore. <laughs> so it needs to go step by step. Upen, if I absolutely. may add something yeah. to, to the best practice point yeah. and, and this handover piece, that's absolutely critical because you can have the best idea, the best uh, POC. Uh, it's just bring it to on the road, yeah? Um, and I think, like, uh, just to give you one example, BMW Garage, BMW Garage, uh, <laughs> sorry to, uh, as a competitor, um, they have this uh, BMW Garage, the ideas they have, uh, or the startup they bring in, they make them work directly with the uh, corresponding unit. Um, within their, their company. Yeah, so they have them working on the concepts uh, f from the beginning. Uh, so you embed it and roll it out um, within, uh, well, as, as you, you do the POC. Right, oh, that's, that's interesting. So, so th w when, when it comes to this handover, or let's say scaling the innovations, um, what do you think is a better option, Sebastian? Any thoughts about uh, you know, scaling it in-house or exit in a positive way, I mean, word exit? 
<laughs> so it really depends on if uh, the innovation you're working on, uh, no matter if it's internal or external, mm -hmm. could really impact the business instantly. And if you can show that you're able to move the needle, whether it's cost-wise or if it's revenue-wise, uh, then you can work with the business. But otherwise, if it's more an innovation that's going to need a couple more years, then you need the end-to-end -end responsibility or someone who's doing that outside. Because otherwise, you're adding too much uh, um, things that will bring the probability of success down yeah. when you have to deal with all the... Um, the uh, things we have to deal with within inside the company. And uh, so the, I think you have to bring it out. And this is something that we also learn because in the beginning you start with people from the inside. They have RWE contracts and you, and you build a nice, an idea, nice idea. And then you realize, okay, we have to spin this out. And then you have the people who are responsible for the project and they have to leave the company yeah, to become the managing director of a startup. Yeah, even if it's well funded, so this this is a fundamental change for the people uh, work before inside the corporation. And so we had to learn how to deal with that. And in the end, we came to the conclusion that there's only one way. They have to 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 uh, give up their RWE contract away. They have to stop. And there is no clause of coming back into the organization. And why is that? Because they need to be really 100% committed Uh, mm -hmm. to what they do and they believe that they are, they are going to be successful. We know they're going maybe to fail or probably they're going to fail, but if they're doing a great job, they, all those are open for them, right. right? But it's really important to do that and say, okay, you're now in a startup. And if you don't want to work in a startup, yeah, maybe you have to uh, doing the next project inside the organization, doing in innovation. But if you really want to build a startup and scale it up, then it's a totally different game. Takes RWE, RWE takes a stake in those startups, or how do you do it? So this is also a challenge, because if you invest a lot of money uh, inside the organization and you spin it off, then it's a matter of the valuation you already have. So we really try to, to do it as early as possible, yeah, and uh, to, to prevent some taxation issue and transferring all the, the assets over to the spin-off. And, uh, and uh, that we are possible to, or that we are able to give a good amount of shares to the founding team because mm -hmm. this entrepreneurial incentivation is really, really important. And I even would go that far that we need to be much earlier in the process and say, you have an a validated idea and we give you a, a good seed investment mm -hmm. to start the company and we're giving it to you as a convertible loan yeah and you start your own company you own 100% of the company and we convert our investment into shares with the first investment round whether it's external investor or maybe internal investor so then you have a 100% entrepreneurial setup yeah mm -hmm. That's, that's interesting. So, so speaking of, again, the whole idea is even though we have that flexibility, everyone expects that the innovation center is successful, right? So that's, that's somehow there. So, so do you think there's a danger of making it a little bit, little bit redundant? Um, so, Thomas, what are your views of uh, what happens after you successfully deliver over the innovation or hand it over or scale it? I'd like to say that at the moment we are at the process of thinking most of our projects who were dying out in the business function later on, we felt, okay, after 10 years, we give them too early to the business line. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we are thinking, um, how can we prevent that, uh, that these are dying out in the business line? And uh, I think there are two aspects. First is that we are trying to discover new um, functionalities like an incubator, like other um, uh, organizations within the network who grow these businesses uh, longer mm -hmm. to a more mature state. And the other thing is that, as I said, also the business units creating their own innovation hubs. Mm -hmm. And with that, the understanding of something different within the normal operative planning is coming and we have to develop something is also increasing. So we see there a bigger chance first in keeping it as a, as a, as a unit within an innovation hub, within maybe new business incubation, yeah. 
and but also having the, the, the opportunities with these business in a way, uh, business, business uh, units with their hubs that we create there an understanding for, for this handover. But it's, we said it's, we gave most of our projects too early into the business line. Right. So you do, uh, Olivier, again, based on, based on your findings, I mean, very interesting point. Uh, what, what, what's, what's the average, let's say, uh, feeling that you get from the market? What's the right point? How, how far should you go mm. before handing it over? Um, well, there's one other tricky point. Uh, what we did, we did actually a study also specifically on Germany, on the um, incubators, accelerators in Germany, just to see how successful uh, they are. Um, and actually, if you look at the, the whole landscape, uh, the oldest ones are four or five years old. Ah. Yeah? So uh, who pump, plug and play, etc. So actually, a business, until it starts, it matures, and you can do the exit, requires up to four to seven years. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> we are not there yet. Yeah. So uh, let's have the discussion maybe in one or two years again <laughs> yeah. and, and see how successful actually <laughs> they really are. Yeah. No, any, any, any commonalities you found between the measures of successes? I mean, Jürgen touched upon a couple of them. Uh, revenue still uh, somehow is a measure, one of the key measures uh, for you. Any, any um, commonalities you find on how are these innovation centers or hubs measured? Um, it differs a lot according to the different types of, uh, of incubators, accelerators. Uh, we analyze in corporate innovation centers. We had a list when we did the study of about 25 KPIs that came out. Okay. So you cannot say, and, and it was really spread all over. Um, it's quite tricky because at the very beginning, what you want to make sure when you start a corporate innovation center, which wants to collaborate with startups, you have one simple KPI is how many startups can I attract? Yeah? When okay. I launch it, how many are really applying or, or getting to me uh, to, to, to apply for the Corporate Innovation Center. So that's the first KPI, uh, most important KPI. Yeah. And the ROI yeah. actually is not important at all at the very beginning. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, also, another very commonly um, asked point is how do you maintain the balance between the Innovation Center activities versus pure pledge R&D? And Jürgen, if I can invite your thoughts on that. What's, what's, what do you see as a trend, one outside, mm -hmm. as well as uh, what do you experience on a day-to-day -day basis while taking business mm -hmm. decisions? Yeah, so most of you probably know the innovator's dilemma and all those innovation centers being accelerators where you bring in startups or as we do it, so we have full-time employees and um, we organically um, innovate in new areas. Um, so one decision on, on board level, for example, is how much resources do I allocate to my core business? How many resources do I allocate to such an innovation space? And on a smaller scale, the same decision is uh, I have to make, uh, for example, how much do we uh, invest in our core business, which is then innovating um, mm -hmm. beyond the 25 by 12 metrics, and how much do we want to invest in research and re may maybe even basic research. Mm -hmm. um, we a bit went away from, from basic research, so with all our research initiatives, um, we have a business owner mm -hmm. who, even if it's, it's not short term, so also revenue, it's, it's not about short term things, but we want to have someone in the organization who desperately wants to have this problem solved. Um, if we have no such advocate <laughs> who like, wants to have that, yeah. then it's probably basic research. We have very good entities in Germany um, taking care of that. And um, therefore, this is like the, the separation of work. Um, SAP has been very, very active in also publicly funded projects. Mm -hmm. um, we scaled that down for some, for some reasons, one of them being, um, is it relevant to the business? You, you have to look what's coming out after three to five years, mm -hmm. um, what's coming out, and is your approach the right one? I think here we also from got got investment from Bernd Leukert to like doing research programs with our money, so we do are not dependent on um, additional money from the German or European government, and that actually also makes quite a difference because then you are super free to to pick what you want to do, and you do not have to adhere to all the programs that are listed out there, and you have to participate because you want to do your PhD, but your PhD takes longer than the two years that the project is running, and then you have to select a new project. Um, success rate of applications is like 20, 20%, something like this. 
Um, so you have to apply to five projects, probably only one or two are really relevant. Um, so that circle of um, how research is being done, I think we also um, solved mm -hmm. and have now a good way. Um, we always could do more. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do more, but of course, also in that setup, you have like financial boundaries you have to adhere to, and that's that's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, Sebastian, from your perspective, the balance between uh, R and D, pure flesh R and D versus the um, activities that you're involved with. Yeah, so RWE decided to really make a clear cut and differentiation between R&D and the innovation hub. So, okay. um, Because R&D is focusing on technology and uh, fundamental research and the innovation hub is all about uh, uh, business model innovation. And so there, there is a connection between them. We, we try to ask them and see what they're doing and what their strengths are and uh, bring them on board. For example, if we see a new battery technology, then we go to the R&D department and ask for help mm -hmm. and their advice. Uh, but in the end, we are focusing on business model innovation. And so there is no overlap or, or concurrence uh, between each other, and uh, we try to do the business model part. We are doing exactly the other way around. <laughs> uh, <Okay. laughs> <laughs> because we went, we were started like like totally independent. I'll get rid of the R and D department, and um, uh, since one year we um, made us, but also the organization, understandable that there is like kind of a yin and yang. The technology is basically in nearly 80% of our cases, the basis of a new business model. And therefore, there has to be a strong link. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the major proof of success is our MB Energy, which we are founding now, and uh, our batteries we are creating, and that we are going to be in the same direction. B because that was purely because we, go, we went there, made workshops with these guys, and said, OK, what can we do? And then we try and find out, OK, let's, let's try to make an ecosystem also for the home with the car, combine it somehow. What can we utilize as assets we do have? What did you develop already? What we can use? And so we are really we are standing here sometimes in front of the RD, and we are like these guys. So we are going more and more closer to them, because also what we experience from the cultural aspect is, you know, the new hipster is probably the old engineer sitting uh, uh, at the dock where he was because he has the knowledge which we just have to open up a little bit and to bring them in a different environment with different people and yeah. let him some freedom because he is locked up in a, in a very tight um, uh, measurement of what he has to do. And that's probably uh, the new ball of the game, let's say, yeah. unlock your engineer sitting on a lot of knowledge but not, uh, is not able to bring it out. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. You mentioned um, brings me to my next and favorite topic. Uh, you know where and how to find those new topics, especially in the established fabrics. Um, you know where there's certain expectation. So one such unlocking uh, measure. Any other thoughts, Sebastian? Yeah. So when when you look at uh, what RWE is facing and uh, where RWE is coming from, so RWE is coming from a five five fifty uh, world. So that means uh, five years of planning, five years of building, and uh, 50 years of operations. And the <laughs> whole organization was, was really focused on doing that. And so that was their business. And it was really yeah. profitable. Yeah. Yeah? And uh, now they have to change. And uh, therefore, you have to, to reach out. And there are a lot of startups in the, in the energy space. And when you look, for example, at peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, so you're really attacking your own business because mm -hmm. then you're cutting yourself out as the middleman and maybe you're only a platform provider uh, in the energy world. And so how to do that? So yeah, you're building up some, some core competencies, but you're doing that a lot with the external world, looking at blockchain, for example, uh, how to, to use blockchain uh, to do the transactions, for example, uh, on such an energy platform. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're really open and working together with the external world and try to find projects and uh, doing, doing uh, pilots together to really learn from each other and find business models mm -hmm. that can help the startup and also RWE and not only retail, be the retailer of the startup, but having joint business models uh, to create uh, some parts of the new energy world. Right. 
Right. No, super. Thank you. Any 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 thoughts from you, Olivier, on on you know uh, particular interesting ways that you've seen people looking for those new topics? Uh, well, actually, that's uh, one of the main reasons uh, to to create this innovation center. Um, it's actually the top reason number two. Uh, to gain these insights on new markets and new trends. Yeah. Uh, because if you live in your own world the whole time, you, you don't have this access. Uh, and actually, the, the first reason to build up the innovation center is to have the network to get these trends get the and answer. insights into the company. Yeah. Um, coming back to this uh, split between R&D and innovation center, I think it depends on, on what you're looking for and the purpose also mm -hmm. of the innovation center. If it's uh, more about incremental products or services innovations you're looking for, you want to have a, a quite a strong link. If it's a completely new business model you, uh, you're looking for, you want to have a dedicated space and uh, I'd say different people yeah. um, because you want to avoid that a unit, an existing unit, kills the new business model idea. So it happens very fast. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, Jürgen, any, any thoughts on... Uh yeah, briefly on sourcing that. ideas. Yeah, yeah. so um, one of our values in SAP is we have like values of our employees is uh, be, cu be and stay curious. So that we give all of the 300 employees that are working in Innovation Center Network. So really it's a um, group thing. Everyone has and has the ability and can contribute. And then, of course, we have um, certain so topics where um, or we do technology scouting and certain people are basically it came from bottom up so people evaluated AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, machine learning which is now a huge topic we will have that here we had to move that to center stage because there's so much interest for later on um, Markus Noga is sitting here will give the presentation um, so all these things came like a small seed and then um, people promoted that, others were interested to, to working on that. And then I would say at SAP we are very, very customer centric. So we have a completely other angle where we have a team, um, mainly our team in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, that is closely working together with customers to understanding what their, what their needs are. It's not the short-term needs, um, I have a bug in whatever system, mm -hmm. but that's really where are they going to, Strate work, working strategically with customers and understanding what, what do they need. And then when we bring both together, um, this is where it becomes really juicy and really interesting. Um, and then we do co innovation projects with those customers and see where it goes. Ah, that's cool. Before I move to uh, one of my favorite topics, which is obviously a culture uh, for the organization. Thomas, afraid of Tesla, Google? Yeah, of course we are afraid of everything. I, I, I mean, not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that the whole company, we are, I mean, we are at the moment, we are at the top of our wave, let's say, of our old business. We, are, we will uh, take over BMW and Audi this year, this is for sure. <laughs> and that, 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 was a, that was a target, that was a 2020 target. We would like premium manufacturer, premium uh, brand number one. So we are at the top, we are, we are achieving the peak Mercedes, let's say. Um, and, but of course we are looking when you would ask us as automotive guys 10 years ago, would something like Tesla ever be possible? We would say no, yeah. of yeah. course not, because yeah. the barriers entering the manufacturing of mass producing cars are so high that nobody can afford it. And that example shows us, oh, it's possible. Um, if you ask me, could you build a Tesla? Yes, we could tomorrow with no problem. And I would say Volkswagen and BMW could do the same. But if you would ask me, could do tomorrow the same stage of connectivity and electrici electricity Tesla is combining, then I would say, mm, we are working on it. <laughs> so to be honest. So, and, and there you see, it's not the hardware which gave us the headache in the game. It's, it's totally different stuff which yeah. give us the headache. Yeah. So small scale business, possible, when you do just have a battery in it and not a an, an, an difficult engine. Um, and the, th the, the things 
surround what what surrounds the the hardware what is the ecosystem what is the operational system who is running the system when autonomous driving is going to be more popular that gives us headache or how has who has the access in the uber environment to the customer is it uber and then it's doesn't make sense to ask whether it's a bmw or a mercedes on it you know that's that these are the headaches when you talk about disruption and when you talk about where are you in this stage and that makes us uh, curious and there we would like to learn much more and therefore also we're trying more to cooperate with companies like SAP coming from a different angle to see look b b before we ask you constantly give us a new system now we probably would ask them hey let's join our forces and to develop maybe some 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 countermeasures or some measures where we play with yeah yeah, so I yeah. was test driving in Tesla last Tuesday in Palo Alto. <laughs> I will not be too harsh with you. Um, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 it's uh, I, I have to say it's pure sex. Uh, it's, uh, uh <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, very bad. So <laughs> I, I, we, we have one question, I guess, at the back. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So. But then you also can ask Olivier. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe me. Uh, he is French. I mean, you, you should take care of him. <laughs> so uh, the question is a um, little earlier about the innovation transfer internally. Yeah. So um, the difficulty I see. Oh, very good. Thank you. So the difficulty I see is um, so we experience this a lot is that you have great ideas as an innovation center and you may be cannibalizing existing businesses, right? And people, product managers at the organization hate you for that, right? So the, the problem you have is the cultural problem. You're coming to that a little later maybe, but you had it earlier in the discussion. How do you align mm -hmm. that this is actually an opportunity for the future to survive as a company or stay ahead of the game? How do you do this? And so this is the one question. And the second question is everyone talks about digitization and bringing um, uh, uh, IT actually into the market. Uh, mm -hmm. People never talk about their own employees, how they transition to this new world. How do you get the people to work in this new world? And I would be really curious from the large corporate perspective, how do you handle this? Jürgen, actually yeah. you answered it a little bit earlier, but yeah. I would be keen to hear more. Yeah. So Thank you for the question. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so. The question is how, if, if you really cannibalize your core business, um, what do you do then? So I would give two answers. Um, we see a lot of opportunities like, beyond our core business. Um, and the second thing, if it happens that it's in your core business, uh, executive board support helps. Otherwise, if you like, have to compete with your little small idea against, uh, I don't know, 100 million euro existing business, um, which is well set up in, in a large corporation, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would add on that, so I see it similar. So you need the board support, but you need also the people inside the organization to really make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you have the board support and the board says, hey, great idea, let's do that, and then you uh, give it uh, down to the organization. Everyone says, oh, it's this board member is coming to me all the time with that crazy uh, shit, how's, how I get rid of that, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And so that, that happens, right? Yeah. And so therefore it's really important maybe to start with parts of the organization, especially if you have a large organization that is really c curious and willing to do that. And you find those people. You have to throw a lot of hooks into the organization, but sometimes there is a bite. And then you have to really don't let them uh, get off the hook, right? And then start working with them. And so this is really what we're doing uh, inside RWE. We, we try to identify those type of people that are willing to do that 
Yeah, and even on top of their 110% uh, job they already do, and you find those type of people. Yeah, and then you, you, you can start, let's say, uh, positively infecting the organization because then you can show something, you can show results, and then there will be the followers. It's like an innovation curve. You have to identify the early adopters who are willing to do that. But you need the support of the board. And if they are not uh, holding their hand over it and say, you, you get the budget and you can do that. And if it fails, don't care. Yeah, I will be there for that. And uh, if you have to ask for excuse, I'm there. Right. Now, absolutely. And <coughs> you actually, both of you, brought back uh, to, to the culture element. Now, many such innovation centers, do we really see that these would be the powerful weapons or the powerful uh, mechanisms to drive that change back into the mothership, as we say? Do we, do we really see those as the key influencers? What's, what's been your research yes. so far? Well, to answer it directly, yes, it definitely yes. is. It's the first benefit uh, any of these corporate innovation centers has. Mm -hmm. um, it reflects uh, towards the employees uh, an image of, we want to be innovative. So, okay, that's the first step. Now it's how, how to get it into the organization. Um, one thing is the location of your innovation center. If you have it far away, it's harder for the people working at the headquarters or in the offices to, to see anything out of it. So how do you communicate this? It's the first thing. Uh, that's why you have, um, just to give you an example of Merck. Merck has its uh, innovation center just in front of its headquarter, but it's in Darmstadt, mm -hmm. but it's in front of it, and they have a, a strong communication uh, with it. Yeah, it's a completely dedicated space, but still the people see, oh, there's something happening. And they have people also transitioning through the uh, innovation center. So uh, that's also a good point and also a very important recruiting attraction point um, for, for also trainees at the very beginning to say, oh wow, there's such kind of a innovation center where I can have a, a next station of six months. Wow. And these people then back in the organization uh, bring those ideas and the, and the spirit also yeah. back in the organization. That's very important. But that's never something you do within a year or two. It's a long process. It's a long, long continuous long process. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and many, many companies also use something like entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship. Uh, we've heard about you. Can, uh, we had such an experience here at the Innovation Center. Two outcomes. One is a new beautiful product, but second importantly is definitely the, the driving uh, force to do that cultur cultural change. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on how this is moving now? Do you do you have the first feedbacks in? Yeah, so I, I can share w what we did internally. Um, so beyond looking um, at new markets, looking at disruptive technologies, um, also colleagues here are very, very motivated to thinking and talking, discussing about new ways of working and what actually should be done. And a program that we uh, started discussing in 2014 and um, implemented last year, first time, is the SAP Intrapreneurship Program. So that's basically an accelerator, but within SAP. So we asked SAP employees to bring forward business ideas. It's no incremental improvements. I don't know, the door is too heavy, or I need to upload larger attachments, but it's business ideas. And uh, we were really surprised, to be honest, how well that worked out. So the team here in Potsdam um, actually drove and is driving this effort. And um, the first round last year, more than 400 teams signed up. Then we had a huge network of mentors, coaches within SAP, um, and domain experts to actually evaluate those things. Then um, it came down to uh, 80 ideas first. We gave a bit more coaching, had a pitching session at Beta House. And in the end, um, we have like five teams that, that succeeded the last stage. They got um, like three months off of work to dedicatedly working on that one. And in the end, pitched to, the, um, to, the, to our board. And two teams of those five then received seed funding. And this, we did, we did another round, which is running in the moment. So again, 430 teams um, came together from all over the world, applied with business ideas. Um, we scaled down to 16. There was a pitching event. And um, now it's the last eight have, again, this three-month period they're working on. Um, and they will pitch, what is it, Johan, next week or the week after that? Um, ne next week. 
think. Yeah. yeah. So next week we again have a pitching session. Mm -hmm. And actually that was so popular also within the SAP executive board that um, they said, okay, um, when we talk about giving something back to the, yeah. to the mothership, um, they said, okay, this is so interesting. This shouldn't be an initiative just driven from the Innovation Center network, but we lift that to a central organization. So we have Quentin Clark as our chief business officer. So that's now the de facto grassroots program within SAP and being rolled out globally, then also having our CFO behind that, having a fund in order to uh, invest into those internal startups. So that's also one of the successes mm -hmm. um, beyond pure products and new businesses that we built how to change the culture of how a company works. Definitely an impact, and I was actually coming to you <laughs> so, uh, for, for on, on your internal innovation project, and I think this is related to that, um, the internal car rental service. Could you share some light uh, on that in that relation as well? Um, yeah, uh, maybe i just like to add that um, um, I, everything I think is, is right, uh, what, what has been said. Um, my thinking and also the company is now at the... At, at the point that we need new leaders. Um, the leadership in the last 20 years probably was too weak. Um, and, and the role now is completely changing if you have more ag agility, if you have more swarm organization. And to, to, give, to, give, to give some people, or, and let's say a lot of people in big organizations, a certain needed security, and at the same time, moving them into agile organizations, you need to have a promise that this is not, this is not going to be a pain. So you need strong leadership, but a very different leadership from the role today. Um, and, and that's going to take longer time, that's clear. Um, but we 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 creating at the moment the program called Leadership 2020 to make clear that um, that has to be um, th one of the major um, projects we have to do getting new leaders on the board to secure the, 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 this movement and uh, because you cannot ask a normal uh, a guy in the marketing department okay let's change uh, uh, and uh, we will see where it will lead us no it's not going to be this way um, uh, you have to uh, guide him or yeah to, 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 to give him a, a ground of something yeah Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, coming back to this, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, internal uh, rental company which we founded, this Mercedes-Benz rental company. Um, I mean, it's a totally different business for the Niederlassung they have to undertake. Yeah? Yeah. At, uh, before they had Sixth and Avis there, and uh, you went there, and, and the customer gets his car, and probably he gets a Mercedes. Sometimes he got a Audi or a Volkswagen or whatever. So we, we, we had to change that. Everybody uh, had to understand it. But of course, we had a massive um, uh, against it uh, because you have different Niederlassung, retail organization, you have different wholesale organization, you have the headquarter organization, you have all the politics involved, where is the risk taking, where is the risk sharing? So, you know, to mic that, it cost us six, seven years to understand that, okay, this is going to be, a business. and this is very clear, uh, close to the core business. It's not, we're not talking about some disruption, we're talking about giving a car of us to a customer for a limited part of time, yeah? And you might think, yeah, what's this? But that's the, that's the, that's the reality, yeah? That's, so also the levers and, and, and um, regional responsibilities and the global um, and uh, um, country organizations, that is a big uh, uh, subject to manage and needs also strong leadership. And another and totally different kind of collaboration between the different lines and functions. I mean, I, I don't know whether we are the only big company where collaboration between the lines is really difficult. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it seems to us that this is one of the major, major uh, uh, hurdles to overcome in the next yeah. years. Yeah. And, and also then to change the whole remuneration uh, uh, process. If I get remunerated by my personal targets, yeah. of course I will fight for these targets. If I get menorated by how many projects you did together successfully with two other business units, uh, then probably I change totally my behavior, right? And and that has to change. And and and. New 
take loans. Work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and new ways of work. <laughs> new ways of yeah. work. For Absolutely, sure. and coming to that, uh, sorry, the bank was here. You, you had one question, or we answered it already. <laughs> I, I have, of course, a, I have a question, but I'm a little nervous well, about the mic. time. Maybe yeah. <laughs> we, I'll talk directly. <laughs> it, it's about, I mean, it comes to your last statement about how to incentivize, and I was really uh, uh, excited to hear that RWE is like trying to give a hundred percent to the founders, and I was a little curious to hear from the other two. How do you? How do you foster entrepreneurial spirit? What are you giving in exchange? And and uh, are you and I know that German companies in particular have a really hard time giving away shares. I mean, mm. we have been working with the Telecom Innovation Labs as well, and I think that was a major issue to really identify the right procedure and the right incentives there. I'd, I'd be very curious about he uh, hearing a little bit more about this from the three remaining ones. I mean, I, we are in the middle of that discussion at the moment. We have no, uh, I have no clear answer to it. Uh, but to give you an example of the stage of this discussion is that I am 25 years working for Daimler. Say, okay, this is already a great, um, uh, uh, no, a very great achievement if you can work in a different environment. environment. Can, you can realize your idea. This is already something really big, and for three months you can work on that. And then the young guys say, no, uh, it's not enough. Uh, I, I'd like to have then a share if that is then the successful. Yeah. And I say, what? No, you are doing innovations for Daimler. So it's not so, um, it's, it's not so easy, but I understand that we, we should adopt that uh, to the bigger organization. And I think we have to find somehow a way, um, but it, it will go more in the direction you presented, more loose from an organization, and that means you have to find uh, 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 um, tools to, to build that uh, relationship. And maybe it is then a 5%, 10% share that is for a Swabian not acceptable and will <laughs> never uh, you know, uh, come to our mind, but we are working on it. <laughs> No, super. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, interesting topic, interesting uh, discussions. We could continue forever. Uh, interest of time, I have to take um, just one or two final thoughts uh, before I forget. Um, Olivia, you've published one or two more questions as well. Yeah. We, okay. So uh, just one thought, well, because one topic we are not going to be able to discuss right now, Olivia. Mm -hmm. uh, you have published a great white paper on innovation centers. Um, and I heard the rumors that it is already updated and we have the next version available. Yes. Well, yeah. mm. is, is it, so uh, can we encourage everybody to tell us about it a little bit about the refresh and uh, maybe you can invite them for a talk later? Sure, yeah. Uh, there are actually two um, actualizations. One is the global uh, study we did last year. Now we did it uh, this year again uh, on the global scale. And the other one I think you're mentioning right now, which uh, just came out, is about the German uh, insights on corporate innovation centers in Germany, uh, which is uh, actually just published. And uh, yeah, I invite you to enter into discussion or just to read it. Uh, all happy of to. Ours are included. Pardon? We are all included. Uh, some are included, not all. I'm sure he's working on his next update starting now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, there was a question. Uh, one more here. Yeah, please. Are you, was there a mic somewhere? Mike. Hi. Right. Hello, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mike. Uh, my name is Uwe Gross from Porsche AG. We also build cars. Not as many as you, but also ex, uh, ex successful. I have a, uh, <laughs> just a question <laughs> for all of you. We, we just, two months ago, one month ago, we just uh, founded our own innovation center. Let's call it like that, Porsche Digital GmbH. Uh, it's an all legal entity. Why we did, uh, did we do that? And that was a question uh, to you, Thomas. Um, we did it outside company, company because we didn't want uh, our core people to get diffused or discouraged from their work they, they were doing the last 25 years or 20 years. And we said, there's, we need new leadership, we need innovation, um, but we still don't know if the, go the whole company needs that and needs, needs a new leadership be mm. because we have people in there who are working really good and we don't want to... Um, in any in any case, danger or success. So why you, especially at Daimler, build it inside? 
It's a it's an inside unit. I think RWE is it uh, an own legal entity or is it all also inside? So it's it's somehow on the edge. So it's 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 an own GmbH, but this uh, is this associated to the um, consulting GmbH. So it's is it uh, it is external, but uh, somehow we use this vehicle to build it up uh, very easily and quickly to use the processes of the uh, consulting business because that was very close to what we are currently doing. But this is also somehow in the discussion. Uh, what's the next step? Yeah, and maybe it's also a spin-off. Yeah, for, for us the same. Basically, we are. I mean, we started as a think tank, and now, we, as I explained, we are uh, thinking over keeping new businesses longer in our hand in, in the kind of an incubation, and that that's for sure we need then a separate legal entity for it. The advantages for that is then increasing to to when you just have a think tank. If you really want to do business in, in something and you want to ally more closely also maybe with startups or with other industry hubs, uh, then you need to have, an, in my view at the moment, a legal entity separately. Yeah. For SAP it was a bit different. So we had quite a long stroke of um, acquisitions that totally made sense and uh, are very good. Um, but we wanted to uh, re um, re-establish and strengthen organic innovation. That's why we said it is an internal thing. We want to strengthen how we as SAP organically get into new markets, organically adopt new technologies. Actually, the, the fewest of the corporate innovation centers are separate legal entities indeed, but if you ask the, the heads, most of them want to be a separate legal entity and wor are working towards it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with our setup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, like, like I said, Tim, it, it's, it's great, and we could really continue these discussions. I'm sure we'll continue it later in our networking mm. opportunities. But uh, so I would not really close it. Close it. I just give Jürgen, uh, Jürgen, quick thoughts, 30 seconds before I give the logistics information for the later part of the day. Yeah, actually, I want to I wanna thank everyone and use the opportunity while we are all on the center stage, we will distribute later on, um, to thanking all the helping hands behind that. So there's a huge team working and was preparing this day here for a couple of months and inviting people, organizing everything. You see it's very nice here. We have a nice setup in the other building as well. Everything is prepared here. So let's give a, a round of applause to all the helping hands. Absolutely. No, great discussions, as I mentioned, will we'll continue. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Really appreciate having a good conversation with you. Thank you for your participation. Now, I've got two important things. Is, isn't it lovely? Being a panelist, I always get the uh, you know, last word as a moderator. As a moderator, yeah, as a moderator <laughs> I always can steal the last word. So uh, I heard that the food is getting a bit aggressive. So, uh, the next <laughs> so, so the next, uh, next part is going to be a, a nice lunch and networking opportunity. Uh, but uh, in order to satisfy your uh, curiosity, satisfy that part of the hunger, the exhibits are also on at the same time. Uh, but they have a little bit of ability to delight as well, which means the desserts are going to be close to the exhibits. So I hope you enjoy both. Uh, you know, satisfy your hunger and uh, get delighted with the exhibits as well. Uh, with that, my name is Upen Barwe. I'm head of customer office uh, for Innovation Center Network. Really a pleasure to have you. And I hope to see you at 1.30 at the same uh, place where we'll discuss artificial intelligence and intelligent enterprises. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.